Welcome to another episode discussing software architecture in practice. Let's talk about the role of architects in software projects. And we begin this discussion with this quote by Frank Gehry, where he talks about uh, he doesn't know why people hire architects and then tell them what to do. You know, it's a really good point. If you're asking someone to design something, why are you telling that designer how to do their job? So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple different aspects. I'm going to talk about um, the relationship between the architect and the project manager and where each of them has a role to play. Then I'll talk about some of the advantages of incremental architecture with stakeholders. And I'll talk about uh, perhaps one of the most popular methodologies for software projects these days, which is agile development and the extent to which architecture has a role to play in agile. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about architecture and distributed development because many projects today are actually um, you know, distributed all over the world. And so distributed development is really important for software projects. Uh, but let's begin with yet another quote where uh, here's a nice little quote by Fred Brooks, who was one of the architects on the IBM 360 system, uh, the main, the big main IBM mainframe in the 1960s. He also later was the author of the Mythical Man Month, which was a book about software projects. And so his quote is, how does a project get to be a year behind schedule? And his answer was one day at a time. You know, something happens, it gets delayed, something happens the next day, it gets a little delayed, and that's, you know, over and over again, additional delays add up. All right, let's talk about the relationship between the architect and the project manager. Um, now, in this particular case, um, I'm using the singular, but in many cases, there will be teams. There might be a team of architects, there might be a team of project managers, but in some cases, there are individuals, depending on the size of the project. Um, but this is an important, uh, overlap. And in some cases, by the way, um, there's one person providing both roles in other cases, you know, there's many people, uh, handling these roles, but basically, you know, as a general, and also every little project is going to be a little bit different in terms of how they, uh, a portion of responsibilities in between the software architect and the project manager. What I'm going to go over here in these slides is one reasonable approach on how you can divide those two roles, but different projects will do it differently. So you can think of the project manager being responsible for the overall delivery of the project, keeping the project on bed, budget, on schedule, and properly staffed. However, to figure out how to do that, uh, the PM will often turn to the architect. Um, now, this slide says that the PM is responsible for external facing aspects of the project and the architect is responsible for internal technical aspects. That is one way to deal with it. However, the reality is it usually is the most senior person is responsible for the external facing aspects of the project. So if the most senior person is in fact the project manager, then they would be responsible for those external facing aspects. But if the architect is the most senior person, then they would be responsible for the external facing aspects. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, when Bill Gates uh, retired as CEO from Microsoft, the job title he took was chief architect for Microsoft. And he was obviously in charge, even though his job title was chief architect and no longer CEO. Uh, even the CEO would say yes, sir, to whatever Bill Gates wanted. So whoever's a senior person is going to be in charge, whether they are the architect or the PM. But in many cases, it will, in fact, be the PM who is the most senior person. Now, um, project managers have their own discipline uh, and they have um, standards for how they um allocate the different bodies of knowledge that project managers are supposed to know. Um, and in fact, the Project Management Institute created an ANSI and IEEE standard, which is known as the Project Management Body of Knowledge, or P abbreviated PMBOK. Um, and it's got a bunch of different project management areas, areas like integration management, scope management, time management, cost, quality, human resources, communication risk, and procurement management. Um, and they're constantly adding additional areas. But when you look at these areas, you realize that just about all of this stuff is stuff that an architect should be involved in. And so in each of these areas, 
the PM should be involved, but the architect should also be involved because each of these areas are important to the success of the project. And at the end of the day, the project will be successful or not successful, not because of the PM, but because of the architect. The architect is the critical person on the project. All right, so let's take a look at how the architect and the PM can work together in these areas. So if we talk about project integration management, uh, the description is ensuring that the various elements of the project are properly coordinated. Well, architects might create designs, they might organize teams around designs, they might manage dependencies, uh, orchestrate requests for change, and so on, all uh, in, the, in this category of integration management. From a scope management, uh, project scope management description says ensuring the project includes all the work required and only the work required, i.e. Not, not going off and doing stuff that's not within scope. And so the architect might be involved in negotiating the requirements, um, estimating the cost, schedule, and risk associated with meeting the requirements, you know, quality attributes, uh, and, and so forth. Um, the next area is project time management. Description is ensuring the project completes in a timely fashion. Well, the, the architect might uh, define the work breakdown structure, might define tracking measures, might be assigning resources to the dev teams. Uh, the next area is project cost management, ensuring the project is completed within the budget. Uh, the architect might be gathering costs from the teams, making uh, decisions regarding build and buy and resource allocations. Uh, the next area is project quality management, ensuring the project will satisfy the needs which it's uh, undertaken. Uh, the architect might design for quality and track the system against the design and decide what the quality metrics are. Uh, the next is human resource management, ensuring the project makes the most effective use of the people involved with the project. The architect might define what technical skills we need. Do we need web developers? Do we need database uh, experts? The architect will, you know, you know, mentor uh, other project members on career paths, recommending training, uh, interviewing and hiring candidates. All of that is stuff that the architect may be doing. Uh, project communications management, ensuring timely and appropriate generation of project information. Um, again, the architect is uh, is critical to communicating among the project team. Uh, you know, understanding what the problems and risks are, um, overseeing the project communications and documentation. From a project risk management perspective. Uh, analyzing, identifying, and responding to project risk. The architect plays an important role in understanding what those risks are, identifying and quantifying them, and adjusting the architecture to mitigate risk when necessary. Uh, finally, from a project procurement management perspective, which is all about acquiring goods and services from outside the organization, the architect, because of their role in the technology requirements, has to determine what outside goods and services are necessary to achieve the goals. So you can see just by going through these areas that the architect is critical to everything that uh, a project manager role covers. So... You can think of the architect as being a shadow member of the project management team, even if they're not officially recognized as a member of the PM team. Um, and so the architect should have a good working relationship with the PM if that's a separate person uh, and be aware of what the PM is handling and make sure that uh, that you understand what the impact is of the PM's job on the architecture. So let's talk about another topic, which is incremental architecture in stakeholders. Um, and this dives into agile technologies. You know, agile methodologies were built on the idea of incremental development, where each increment delivers additional value to the customer or user. So I want to talk about agile in a little bit, but um, generally speaking, even if your project is not an agile project, you should develop and release your architecture in increments. Uh, there's a number of reasons why incremental architecture makes sense. You know, um, primarily the idea is, you know, by re releasing a smaller increment, you can see that everyone uh, understands your, your architecture before it's, uh, it's finished. And you can get immediate feedback on the parts you have completed and you can improve the overall design as opposed to sort of a following a big bang approach where you only release the architecture when it's completely done. Now, part of what you should think about when you are going to do an incremental architecture is what are you releasing in increments? 
You know, you might want to think about um, if you're building multiple different architecture views, which architecture views are you going to release and to what level of detail are, you, uh, are those architecture views going to describe the current iteration of the architecture? So, for example, if you're creating a first increment of an architecture, you might consider some of the different uh, architecture views that I have up on this slide. So, for example, you might have a module decomposition structure view showing uh, the team structure for the project. You know, we're going to have a dev team that's focused on a, a web UI. We're going to have a database uh, team and so on. And so then we can use that uh, module decomposition structure to determine what sort of budget we need for our teams. Uh, we might have a module uses structure view. This will allow increments to be planned uh, in terms of which modules are using which other modules. Uh, we might uh, come up with a runtime component connector view uh, to show the runtime of your system. And you might have a deployment structure showing where the software is going to be deployed, whether it's in the cloud or on mobile devices and so on. So the basic idea is to have some preliminary uh, architecture views that will allow the project to get going with your first increment, even though your architecture is not completed. So when you're coming up with uh, these initial views, you should think about who the stakeholders are in the project and what their needs are. So you can design um, the appropriate documentation for those stakeholders. Um, and work with your stakeholders to determine, you know, when they need additional uh, architecture uh, solutions in an addition in the next increment. Um, and you might want to ensure that your early releases of the architecture deal with the hardest quality attributes so that uh, the hardest work is done early and it's relatively easy to handle the remaining work later on. And then stage your architecture releases to support um, the work that developers are planning to work on. Um, you know, so if um, developers are planning to work on the redundancy, then have that done early on. If the developers are happy to deal with uh, some of the other aspects of the system later on, then save that till later. All right, let's talk a little bit about agile development. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to switch over to sharing something else here. Um, let's talk about Agile. Agile is actually one of the most popular software development uh, methodologies today. And it really dates back to the 1990s where people were upset with the waterfall uh, so approach to software development. And in the early 2000s, a group of people came up with what they called Agile. And this really took off after a uh, meeting where, um, you know, 15 or so people got together and came up with this manifesto for software development. And here we've got a little picture of some of those people around the whiteboard where they actually came up with this, as well as some principles that they wrote down describing what agile software is about. And so they say here, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value uh, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there is some value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. And then you got um, the signatures from 17 um, people who are relatively famous for their work in the software development field. Um, and so just taking a quick look at this again, um, they said they valued individuals and interactions, you know, you know, people and the interactions between people over tools and processes. So focus on the people and how the people work together. They said uh, they prefer working software over documentation. So make sure the software works. Show the customer that it works. Don't stress over the documentation. Uh, they said they value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So work closely with the customer and don't stress the fine details of the contracts. Uh, and finally, responding to change. 
And again, this gets back to Agile because Agile is all about responding to change over following a plan. So why would you want to be able to respond to change over following a plan? And that's because life is a series of changes. There's going to be lots of changes. You can't write a plan that can handle all the changes. So it's more important to be able to respond to change than it is to be faithful to a plan. All right, so those were the basic uh, ways in which they think you should be developing software. Now, they also had 12 principles of Agile software, and then they have a list of signatures. I'm not going to go into that list of signatures, but you know, thousands of people have signed this, including myself. I signed it um, about 12 or 13 years ago, probably 13 years ago. Um, let's take a look at the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. Um, we follow this print, these principles. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So think about that. Early delivery. Don't ask the customer to wait five years for the software. Give them something really fast that works. Think weeks or days. And then continuous. We'll continue to improve it over time. Uh, welcome changing requirements, even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. So in other words, require, changing requirements is not a bad thing. Instead, it enables the customer to have a competitive advantage over their competitors. And so we should be ready to handle new requirements, even if we're late, already working on uh, building the system and we have to change the system. So you know, design your system so it's easy to change the system. Um, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter time scale. And again, this gets back to uh, early and continuous delivery. Uh, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. So here what they mean is really by business people, they mean the people who are paying for the system, working with the people building the system. Um, and but work together daily. Not the person the person paying for the system, you know, writes you a note and says, please give me this. And the developers go off and work five years and then deliver it five years later. And instead, they should constantly be talking to them every day saying, here's the latest version. What do you think? And by getting that constant daily feedback, you accomplish two things. First, um, you get a better product because you're constantly getting input on what the product should look like. Second, the business person is constantly seeing what he's paying for. So he's happy. He knows what he's paying for. And um, there will be no surprises on what the final product looks like. Uh, build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. In other words, don't micromanage. Uh, let them go do it. Uh, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and with a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Of course, nowadays we got things like Zoom and Skype to do that, um, so you can do uh, you know a web-based face-to-face. Uh, but I think the argument here is that instead of sending a memo or sending a document, talk to someone and you'll be much more effective. Uh, working software is a primary measure of progress. So again, he, uh, going back to that early delivery, if you're constantly showing people working software, hey, that's how you can measure progress. Um, finally, we've got agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. All right, this has to do with um, what was often called in the 1990s death march projects, where you would have a project and it would be behind. And so before you have a deadline, people would work 80 hours a day uh, or 80 hours a week, sorry, trying to get the project done by the deadline. And then after they hit that deadline, they would collapse and take a couple of weeks off to recover. And then they'd come back, they'd start off working 40 hours a week and then they'd realize they're behind and then they'd start working 80 hours a week until you know they hit a deadline and they'd collapse again and so on. So instead of that sort of approach, it should be, you know, your project should be able to handle 40, out, 40 hours a week uh, indefinitely as opposed to requiring all-nighters. Um, the next comment is continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Yeah, so focus on good design and technical excellence and your project will end up being agile. 
Uh, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Yeah, so keep it simple. Um, you know, if you're going to draw, you know, just to take like um, a road example, if all the cars in the country are going to drive on one side, you know, pick one side and stick with it. We're always going to drive on the right side or we're always going to drive on the left side, but pick one and stick with it. So keep it simple uh, because if you keep what you're designing simple, then that saves you a lot of time and effort, which means you can spend that time and effort in other places to build a better system. Uh, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Again, this gets to um, not micromanaging, but letting the team figure out how to do these things and how to organize. Um, and at regular intervals, the team should reflect on how to become more effective and then tune and adjust its behavior accordingly. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, if one member of the team realizes that they're much better at doing something than someone else, they can take over that responsibility and let the other person focus on what they're much better at. Um, all right. So those were the main principles behind the Agile Manifesto. All right. So I'm going to go back to the slides at this point. So let's talk about um, Agile, you know, and I do have, you know, Agile, I, I really look at Agile meaning adapting to change. You know, you're Agile enough to hurdle over uh, an obstacle in the road. Um, and we got this quote by Charles Darwin, uh, the author of On the Origin of Species, where he says, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. And so that's really what Agile is all about, being able to handle new requirements, being able to compete uh, with the unforeseen. So one question you might have is how much architecture should we use in an Agile methodology project? Um, and there's no single right answer to that question. Uh, but you can find a sweet spot for a particular project. And the right amount of architecture work for a project depends on several factors, project size, requirements, and so on. You know, let me give you an example. Let's suppose that um, I'm going to build a, a shed in my backyard. And the shed is going to have four walls and a roof. It's not even going to have a door, but it will have a doorway. All right. Um, that doesn't require a lot of planning. You know, I could probably write my plans for the shed on a napkin and it would probably be okay. On the other hand, let's suppose I'm going to build a skyscraper 30 stories high. You probably should have some architecture blueprints, a lot of them. You know, you want to have blueprints for the foundation. There's a lot of work that goes into building a skyscraper from an architect perspective. Um, and so, although you can put a tiny amount of architecture work into that shed, um, you should put significant architecture effort into that skyscraper. And so the more costly, the more risk, the, the larger the project, the more important architecture is. A small one-person project might not need much architecture work. A large, complicated project involving lots of people and lots of resources probably does require a significant effort uh, by the architectures team. All right, so here, for example, is a diagram showing several different approaches to architectural design. Um, now, our vertical axis is design effort. Our right axis is uh, time. And this diagram over on the left is the big design upfront approach or BDUF. So lots of design effort uh, in the initial time of the project. And then the design effort goes down over time. So this is like your traditional waterfall cycle project from the 1990s. Um, over here on the... Um, Step B is what we might call the emergent approach, or it might be what you might call agile architecture, where basically um, you have some architecture in every development cycle. 
for the new iteration, we do some architecture. So there's a little bit of architecture all the time. Now, there's also what's known as the iteration zero approach, where they do a decent amount of architecture up front and then slowly uh, reducing it over time. Um, so this is three different examples of how architecture and agile, uh, you know, methodology can work together. And which one you go with uh, really should depend on the size and scale of your project. If you're dealing with, you know, the example of the skyscraper I mentioned before, you might want to go with a lot of design up front. On the other hand, um, if you're doing something really small, the emergent approach is probably the way to go. And in the middle, you might want to go with something like the uh, iteration zero approach. Um, so, um, and we also talk a little bit about this when we talk about the iterations uh, for attribute driven design in another lecture. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that during that lecture. Um, there is some arguments that, but for some of the uh, agile uh, proponents that um, if you're not creating working software, you're not creating something of value. And while that may be true for really small projects where you don't have to communicate with others, once you start dealing with communication with others, there is value in the communication, even though you're not programming. Um, and so, you know, the result is, you know, people know that when you're working with other people, some amount of time has to be spent on communication. Now, if you're only working by yourself, then yeah, you can, you don't, you can focus entirely on working software and you don't have to engage in communication. Um, here's a little, uh, cross-reference chart showing, uh, some of those agile principles and mapping into how architecture maps into it. Basically, everything in the Agile Manifest that we took a look at applies equally to architecture. So I'm going to skip through that part. Um, another approach to applying Agile at very large scales is often is referred to as scaled Agile framework, uh, sometimes referred to as SAFE. Uh, scaled Agile framework provides a set of workflows, rows, and processes to handle Agile at large larger scales. And includes the role of the architect uh, and also talks about emergent design uh, approaches as well. All right, let's talk about agile and distributed development. Uh, most substantial projects today are developed by distributed teams where distributed may mean spread across, you know, floors in a building, across buildings in an industrial campus, across campuses in multiple time zones or among, you know, different organizations even uh, scattered around the globe. Uh, distributed development has a lot of benefits. Um, you know, you can scale up much faster than you could in the old days, but also has some challenges. Um, you know, requiring, um, you know, additional understanding of what labor is available, what, not, what markets are available, and how the costs will work. So how does distributed development play out on a project? So in this particular case, assume module A uses an interface from module B. And in time, we may need to modify that interface. You know, you know, basically you got a dependency and you're gonna need to modify it. So when you're gonna when team B who's working on module B needs to modify it, they need to coordinate with team A. Now, if they're in two different time zones, then they have to work on a time that works out for both of them. Methods for coordination include informal contacts documentation, meetings, asynchronous electronic communication, and so on. Uh, so what does this mean for architecture and the architect? Allocation responsibilities to teams is more important in distributed development than in co-located development. Attention to dependencies takes on added importance. You might want to make sure that um, if there's dependencies that your distributed teams do have the ability to collaborate. And documentation like wikis becomes especially important when you're in distributed development. And you, you won't necessarily be able to have face-to-face -face conversations with your coworkers, and you have to rely on other communication mediums.
So in summary, this lecture talked a bit about architects and their roles in the context of projects. We talked about the fact that the architect and the project ma management team have complementary roles. Um, the project management team is focused on running the project from an administrative perspective, whereas the architect is running it from a technical perspective. Um, and the architect is critical in order for the project management team to be successful. We also talked about the fact that architectures are released in increments that are useful to stakeholders. So architects need to have a good understanding of the architecture stakeholders and their information needs. Uh, we also talked about agile methodologies and how architecture and agile work together. And we talked about the fact that, you know, with global development, there, need, there is a need for explicit coordination that requires more formal strategies than, than what you need when you're in a co-located development project. So thanks for watching this uh, video on architecture and tune in next time when we'll dive deeper into software architecture.